Well, welcome everybody uh, to our first Remarkable Insights. Uh, my name is Pete Horsley. I'm the founder of Remarkable. Remarkable is a division of Cerebral Palsy Alliance and uh, Cerebral Palsy Alliance is a disability service provider in New South Wales in Australia and also ACT. And uh, we have um, great partnerships with uh, a couple of other organisations as well, ICANN New South Wales, Telstra and also Microsoft as well. Um, and Remarkable's mission really is about seeing technology and innovation um, being brought, brought to bear around uh, disability inclusion. And so we do believe that technology has some of the answers to, to make uh, around around uh, inclusion of people with disability and to take down some of the barriers that we do see still existing in society. Um, and one of the main things that we do, uh, many of you will have, have been with us last week uh, for our, our culmination of our 16 week accelerator program where we had seven exciting startups uh, pitching to uh, about 450 people online last week, um, which was very exciting and you can catch up on all of that on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land. Um, we are each uh, on Indigenous land, no matter what country we're from, um, but particularly here in Australia, we're on Indigenous land and we want to pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that, uh, that, that their land is sacred land and we can do more to, to be inclusive of our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. Um, also want to, um, so today's conversation is about insights, uh, innovation coming through the disability lens. And uh, we want you to participate in that conversation as well um, through a number of different ways. There's uh, obviously through this webinar, we have the chat function, so you can post questions uh, during tonight's conversation. Uh, you can also jump onto social media as well, and you can see our, um, our various uh, social media um, uh, flavors over on the side here on the screen. Uh, so we're on LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we're uh, at Remarkable Tech. Um, the Instagram one does have a little underscore between Remarkable and Tech. Um, and we'd ask if you could use the, uh, the hashtag uh, Remarkable Insights as we participate in this conversation tonight. Um, also tonight has live captioning. So cl closed captions are available and you can click that. Um, in the little box just down on the bottom in your toolbar. Uh, and we're also uh, joined uh, tonight by our Oslo interpreter, uh, Taryn Coswell. Thanks for joining us, Taryn, as well. And tonight we're, we're joined by three incredible guests as well. Um, I'd like to introduce Srin Matapali, who uh, his company, uh, Accommable, was, was purchased by Airbnb. Um, we've also got uh, Jackie Leach Scully, he's the director of the, the Disability Innovation Institute at UNSW. And we've also got Janice O'Connor uh, from Oninda in Melbourne. So, welcome to each of our guests. So, as I said, tonight is about a conversation, and so we do want you to participate in that conversation. Uh, and we want to have brave conversations around this. We do believe that. Uh, that, that this opportunity gives us um, uh, some time to, to really consider the role that innovation, that disabilities played in innovation over the years. And Serena, I might start with you. Um, we've seen ambitious brands like Tommy Hilfiger and Apple and Microsoft that really understand uh, that when you design for, um, for disability, you can actually have, when you design for a broader audience, you can have a competitive advantage. Um, I've also heard you talk about um, uh, the history of innovation and, and seeing um, the ways that we've designed at the edges and then optimised for the whole or optimised for the masses. So things like um, eye gaze uh, technology, things like voice to text and text to voice, uh, even um, our keyboards that, that many of us have typed on tonight. Um, uh, I even saw double drawer dishwashers is, is another thing that uh, was designed originally for disability. Curb cuts, all of these things. So what do you notice about the role that disability, disability plays in creativity? Um, thanks, for, thanks for the question, Pete. Like, I think at a fundamental level, like 
I just truly believe that sort of optimizing for designing for disability at the beginning is just a great proxy for so many things. Like I, I say this sort of semi-jokingly, semi-seriously, but like, you know, disabled people are a great proxy for like labor saving technology. So like, you know, I use something because I physically haven't got the ability to, to reach or to like press things or to use an entire variety of, of existing devices. So technology that like accommodates my lack of physical capability actually is a great proxy for just general labor saving for the general population. And who doesn't love like, you know, like saving on effort, right? We all love it. Um, so, you know, I, I do think it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic innovation proxy for the future where like I use voice technology now because, you know, I simply haven't got an option. Whereas, you know, if you're just sitting on the sofa and you just really can't be asked to like go to the other side of the room to switch the lights on, you can just use your Alexa. So it's a great, like, you know, it's a, it's a great stepping stone. Um, so, you know, I think just one on a, on a fundamental sort of creative level, I, I think it's a great proxy. And then just secondly, I think there's just also the opportunity, right? Like as partly remarkable, I'm sure has observed, this is a sector that is deeply underserved, deeply kind of neglected. So if anything, you know, in some markets, you may have to spend bajillions and bajillions just to get your product up and running. Whereas in a sector that is so underserved, like the world of disability, just, you know, it's just so much easier, I think, to get traction because you're just not dealing with so many hundreds and thousands of competitors. Um, so on the whole, I, I think this is why I think optimizing for, for working with the disability community and, and designing for disability can, can have very like, can have impact straight off the bat. Mm, brilliant. And then Janice, uh, COVID-19 really has meant that everyone is experiencing inaccessibility in some way. Um, and yet people who are really the experts of, of inaccessibility still haven't really been engaged in this process of, of saying, how can we design a better future? So what should be the role of inclusive design tackling tough problems like COVID-19? Yeah, Pete, that's a really good question. So I think what we've found with COVID-19 is it's kind of led to a really rapid change in our thinking um, as a society about what we can do and how much more flexible we can. So. If you look, for example, we're all working from home, we're using a variety of tech platforms, we're juggling numerous commitments. And these are things that people with disabilities have always kind of had to do. So whereas now with COVID-19, it's forced society there. So I kind of think this experience has, teaches us a lot about systems. So how can we design systems that are a better fit for people moving forward that are much more exclusive, inclusive and work for everyone? I think there's a lot of opportunities. I look at telehealth, for example. Um, that's been fantastic for a lot of the cohort of people that I've been working with. Online learning is another. So I've heard some really great stories from teachers working with young people with autism about how COVID and remote learning has really been great for some of their students. So those are people who normally find day-to-day -day of class the classroom a real challenge, but in COVID-19 have been able to excel with remote learning. And, and this is a question broadly for the panel as well. You know, I've, I've heard uh, some of my friends with disability have been saying, finally, like we're, we're seeing the opportunity to, to work in the way that we've been trying to petition for for many, many years. Um, do you find it sad that we're, we're having to, you know, have a, a global pandemic to get to this point? Well, I mean, I can I can respond to that one if you like. I, mean, I think it's not Thanks, just Jackie. It's not just sad. It's uh, I think it's quite enraging for a lot of people with disability that, uh, as individuals and collectively, we've often been politely requesting, sometimes not so politely requesting, sometimes demanding um, various adaptations, accommodations, whatever language you want to use, they're often to enable us to do um, what other people do, uh, it's like working from home. Uh, and it has always been too much trouble, or it's been too expensive, or it's been too something. And 
the fact that it's happening now for a, a, a majority of people, perhaps, or a larger swathe of the population, that's, you know, it's really good. But it sort of rubs in at the same time that um, the feeling, whether it's unconscious or not, that frankly, we weren't worth it. And that we're going to benefit perhaps from it now, hanging on to the coattails of the, the benefit for the wider stroke non-disabled population. But still, it's being done for them rather than for us. And that's putting it a bit crudely, you know, a bit, a bit of cartoonish uh, fashion. Uh, but I think there's, there's some elements there that are worth thinking about as we, as we move on. Pete, I think the thing for me is, is the, the importance of flexibility. And, and I think it's that kind of as long as you can get the work done effectively, it's that mindset of like, we are open minded to how you get that work done, whether it's yeah. at home, whether it's an office, it's, you know, we, we, we trust your, your individual decision making on how you feel work can best be done. Um, because yeah, just to like to, to, to confess it, I, I actually have missed being like in an office and around people. Um, I mean, I, I've always worked from home a lot and um, I, where we are, we've had sort of a, like sort of an unspoken flexibility rule where if you need to get stuff done at home, if you need to come into the office, nobody really cares. But actually like, you know, I have actually quite missed just being around people that I enjoy working with and just sort of the day-to-day -day sort of chit chat, grab lunch and sort of the, the social well-being aspect of, of, of being around people that I enjoy being around. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think what, what I think hopefully we'll see is an opening up of, of, uh, of more options and, and a greater understanding of uh, people's work preferences in amongst mm -hmm. this. Now, Jackie, you talk about the um, to you talk about the importance of being careful about uh, technology being the solution for inaccessibility, and that that might seem like a bit of a radical view when we, when when it's coming from um, remarkable tech. We're we're a tech accelerator. We 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 love kind of talking about the role that technology plays. But I think you've 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 got a really interesting view of of understanding. Um, uh, this idea of individual versus collective provision um, and mm -hmm. um, and particularly kind of considering who bears the cost of of accessibility and I wondered if you could give us um, kind of you, you give a great example around um, stair climbing technology but do you want to kind of talk a little bit to that yeah, I want to say in advance, you know, I'm certainly not a, a Luddite or an enemy of technology and technology has kept me alive and kept me functioning and kept me going and so on. But I think there is a tendency, uh, particularly among us who are keen on technology, um, to see it as the, the answer to, to every problem. If we can design a bit of kit that will enable somebody to uh, work their way out of a particular difficult situation, then that's the answer. And I think that's what's happened with things like um, stair climbing technology and uh, for, for wheelchairs. There are a few other classic examples as well, but every couple of years there'll be an announcement about um, uh, the development of uh, a, a mobile wheelchair which can go upstairs, usually outside, outdoors. Um, and these are impressive machines and people have put a lot of effort into them. They're very ingenious. Um, usually my friends and colleagues who use wheelchairs sort of look at them, roll their eyes and say, well, they're just, you know, they're useless in real life. They're a great idea, but not only are they often much clumsy and clunkier than the kind of wheelchair that people would prefer to use, which are nippier, more agile, um, it is an individual solution to a problem which is, you know, out there and that could be solved much more simply with the completely boring, unsexy uh, concrete ramp, um, which have been with us for a long time. The concrete ramps and tend to, um, they are um, boring and unsexy. They solve that particular problem, getting from one level to another. They're not people who are using wheelchairs, but for uh, people pushing prams, people with um, shopping baskets on trolleys, even people who just find going upstairs quite tiring. Um, so it solves the problem for not just people who are using wheelchairs, 
but it also solves it collectively because it's society as a whole, you know, taxpayers, whoever's actually funding this thing ultimately, who are putting in solution there. Uh, and I think that's a really fundamental point. It's not just about, well, a really high tech piece of equipment is only, um, is only available to rich people, which may well be true, but it's a kind of principle of are we as a society going to do the sorts of things which make the world accessible to as many of our members as we can? Or are we going to look at them and say, nah, tough, you deal with it? I think that's brilliant, Jackie. Like I really uh, think that that's a conversation that I don't hear happening very often. Um, mm. Yeah, that, that kind of, it's a rights issue really, isn't it? About, about who, who bears the cost and who is the one that needs to um, uh, yeah, create that change, um, who has value. Um, so if, we, if we're to imagine, and I'll throw this to the whole panel, if we're to imagine uh, the kind of inclusive future that we all want to see, uh, if we are thinking about what can we do now to actually seed that, that inclusive future, what are some of the things? I might start with you, Srin. Oh, sorry, I started talking on mute again. I keep, keep doing that. Um, so, look, I, I think from, from, from the perspective of, of what you guys do, look, I think there's multiple different facets here. I think, firstly, you are sort of aggregating and bringing together a lot of key stakeholders in the system, whether it be technologists, entrepreneurs, policymakers, investors, all the different bits that help collectively drive that change, you know, what you guys are doing, you, you sort of be that forum to bring that in. I think secondly, it's also just a platform for some necessary advocacy that needs to be done. It is all gray, you know, with some newfangled sort of technology that sort of does, does, does whatever it claims to do on the tin. But unless there are other systemic changes that are associated with that, then, you know, effectively like all the technology in the world is not going to, is, is not going to fix that. Um, and so I think, you know, again, you guys can be a really important platform for, 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 for facilitating that, that advocacy. And then I think third, it's, it's you can be, again, it, it's, it's making sure that when, there, when things are, have been done well and there are success, success stories, it's really celebrating them and sort of creating that flywheel where it brings in more people who want to get involved and invest and support and starts that kind of virtuous cycle upwards. That's brilliant. How about um, you, Janice? Yeah, I just might add, I think um, it's really important to have a really solid understanding of need and benefit. So need not only towards the individual, but of all members of the community, everyone who's using spaces and has um, different needs and look at building that benefits most people. Every, you know, if we can kind of go from that way, we are going to build a much more inclusive society, much more inclusive products and services that everyone can use regardless of disability or not. That's brilliant. Thank you. Jackie. Yeah, yeah I think that that's true. And uh, there are a lot of caveats that I can hear that people are putting in uh, now around, um, you know, as far as possible and as many people as possible. And I think that's realistic because there's no world that one can imagine that would be completely accessible for absolutely everybody at every stage of their life in every uh, condition. Um, I suppose you know, if you have a situation in which most people are pretty happy with some niggles, you're probably getting it about right. Um, because something, a situation which is 100% perfect for one sector of the community is almost by definition not going to be good for other sectors. So you've, you've, you've got to try and find a balance. But as Janice was saying, the only way that you can do that is by drawing in as many perspectives and views as possible from the people who are going to be using this environment, this space, or this piece of, of, of equipment. That's great. And then, um... I do encourage you, uh, um, as you're listening to this, to type any of your questions into the, the chat function or into the, sorry, into the Q&A function, I should say, mm -hmm. at the bottom. 
um, but we have had a question come through on the chat function as well. Um, Alice has asked, what changes would you like to see in the world to make our society more accessible and inclusive? Uh, what type of systemic changes would you want to see? Jackie, do you want to take that one? There's certainly something about not simply doing something the way that we've done it before because it works before. Uh, and people, I think, systems in particular institutions will, organisations like my own university, you know, you, you will inevitably go back to the way that you've done it before because it's least energy and it works reasonably well. Um, one of the very few uh, positives of the situation we've been finding ourselves in since uh, COVID emerged is that it has been a really major prompt for a lot of people to realise that um, the, the SOP, the business as usual way we've done things before, just isn't possible for the majority of people, let alone for people with disabilities. So in a sense, that levels the playing field. Um, and we have, if there is the political will behind it and the social will and to be brute, the cash uh, behind it as well, it, it is a great opportunity to, to make... Um, society more accessible and inclusive if we put our minds to it. What about the questions in around um, what type of systemic changes would you like to see? To me? Uh, yeah. So, 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 Someone else can take that one. <laughs> so Pete, was that so directed to me? So I didn't quite catch you. Yes. If, if yeah, you take oh. that one, Srin. Um, sure. So, so pondering this question, I don't think there is sort of, you know, something that works everywhere. I actually think that every country has, has things that need to be done for, 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 for a mixture of reasons. So, for example, Pete, you know, when we first met in San Francisco last year, I mean, you saw firsthand, you know, some of the, the very dystopian social inequalities that, that, we, that, we, that we've witnessed out there. And for, for those sort of... Um, uh, watch, watching this webinar so like you know I, I uh, just before January I, I'd been living in in San Francisco for for just over two years and you know one of the biggest challenges in, in living in, in America and California is just the complete absence of any or you know not I mean, there is some but like relative to other western nations the challenge of getting any like state support for things like care and health care and all the kinds of things that I had taken for granted living living in the UK all of my life. And, you know, you know it's very hard to, to, to put any kind of level playing field together when some of those really important social welfare nets just are, are, are non-existent. Whereas maybe somewhere like in the UK, I mean, again, granted, some of those safety nets have been eroded in, 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 in recent times. But, you know, maybe over here, the problems would be more about like, I still have to call up a restaurant to double check whether it's accessible in a way I would not have had to do in America just because pretty much everyone's scared of getting sued. Um, it's, 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 so, you know, you've, you've got those, those different types of, of changes that kind of need to be done based on different countries and sort of what the history has been to date regarding sort of disability inclusion. Yeah, and... Um... And kind of, I guess, staying with, with you, Srin, um, uh, and I'd like you to tell us just a little bit of the story of, of kind of Accommable uh, and Accommable um, being, being uh, um, merging with Airbnb. Um, and tell us during that, we've, we've got a question from Marina here, um, who's in Sydney. She'd like to know kind of what are the diverse skills and experiences that have allowed uh, you to achieve greater success? And what are the skills needed to drive change? So, give us the uh, short version of the of the accommodable story, and um, and tell us about the skills that you that you had that that allowed that change to take sure. place. Sure. So, like, I guess the sort of the, the forty five second summary was that you know I was a, a corporate lawyer retrained as a web developer. I went traveling for a period about 10 years ago and it was just really, really, really difficult because I would turn up to places and they would claim to be accessible and they just simply weren't. And so in, in 2015, I, I teamed up with a friend of mine and built a, a web application called Accommable, which was basically trying to build like the travel platform of my dreams um, and making sure that information was accurate. There was photography for everything. 
and that sort of turned into to one of the leading players for accessible travel in our sort of core markets in Western Europe. And so that was 2015. And then end of 2017, Airbnb acquired a Commable and asked me to come out to San Francisco and sort of build out this new division within Airbnb and create the foundations of what accessible travel on, on Airbnb could look like. Remember, so what was the second question again, Pete? Second part of that was just what skills that you had um, that, that allowed you to achieve that su success um, and to kind of drive that change? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question and where people have asked, look, you know, there's been other sort of travel sites or other like travel advocacy initiatives around accessible travel. But the thing that I think Airbnb saw in us was that we were execution focused. We were very much around tech and product from day one. I myself, you know, built most of the code base in the early days. And, you know, advocacy is one thing, but actually building product that has scalable potential and can be deployed and executed at scale is, a, is an art and science in itself. And this was the thing that I think that we could do above and beyond other travel players in, 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 in the sector. And so it was, you know, it was being that bridge between understanding disability or some aspects of disability from a, a personal perspective of those of us in the team, but also having some of the practical skills and operational expertise to like ship and deploy and, you know, get, get, get what we built out into as much of, as much of the world as possible. And you did tell me in part of telling the story, you were saying that you literally went and knocked on doors. Like, can you, like tell us a little bit about kind yeah, of the things so that you did to kind of make it sort happen. of in, in in startup folklore, there is like a, a, a sort of a maxim in the early days, you know, do things that don't scale in order to learn what your, what your users and customers needed. So when we first posted on social media, hey, you know, we're accommodable, does anyone have any like properties that they recommended? Um, you know, we would get kind of feedback from the community. I would then go and contact that property owner. And so in the summer, autumn of, of 2015, I must have done about three to 4,000 miles around Western Europe, staying with different property owners, manually recruiting them, um, taking lots of pictures and just making sure that like, you know, in any kind of two-sided marketplace, you're only ever as good as the worst listing on the platform. And so making sure that we were setting the quality and standard bar as high as possible. And then, you know, bringing on a couple of, of other team members who were just, again, helping make sure that every listing was crafted to perfection as possible. That's brilliant. No, I think there's some great lessons in there for founders. Now, we've had a, a question from Laura uh, saying, Jackie makes a good point about the advent of flexible working practice during COVID. And it's proved that accessible working re uh, arrangements are feasible. How can we leverage these learnings to make systemic change in the workplace and to make corporates more open to people with special needs? How can governments incentivize this transition? Jackie, do you want I to take that one? Have a go, have a go anyway. Uh, I think to be realistic, uh, it will be by uh, outcomes and by evidence. And we've already have uh, in the world of, uh, of business, a lot of evidence showing that you know, flexible working and the capacity to work from home uh, basically makes businesses and, uh, and so on more competitive. Um, we also have evidence showing that on average, people with disabilities are much better, more reliable, steadier and so on as employees um, and tend to um, pay back the employer's investment if there is one many times over and put those sorts of evidence together. It requires a bit of time to start getting the empirical evidence out, but I think that's the kind of thing which convinces um, corporations, employers, organisations to move in that direction, um, telling them that this is the right thing to do in terms of rights, uh, justice, equality and so on. Um, to be honest, I don't think it has enough pressure in, uh, in, in, a, in such a highly competitive world. I wish it did. As an ethicist, I wish that being told that the right, this is the right thing to do meant that people would do it. But sadly, I think on the whole, people and organisations, institutions in particular, need to feel that if they change this, they're in some way going to be in practice better. 
and be able to do their job better. And I think we can already show that it's getting the message out uh, that will create enough of a momentum. And then I think it's a matter of normalizing it. It should, it's, it's something I believe in um, very strongly and, uh, and a message I try to get across uh, as much as I can. This should never be, or should, should as soon as possible, not be um, special adaptations, things that are added on at the end when you've sorted out everything else, when you've organized everything else, because that means that those um, little frills on the edge, um, which is kind of negative way of what Srim was talking about earlier, those little frills around the edge are the first things to go uh, under pressure. And that's those things really deeply embedded in normal life. And then sticking with that uh, area, Janice, I wonder if um, we can think about kind of the area, the area of employment and for, for people with disability. What are, what are some of the things that you're going to see change around employment for people with disability? Golly, you could, I could spend all night talking about this. I suppose the number one thing I really want to see is earlier access to employment for people with disabilities, especially people with intellectual disabilities. People with intellectual disabilities should have the same rights and opportunities to get a part-time casual job when you're 15, 16 and start to learn those employability skills. And then like all of us, when we finish school, build on your career and don't just be in one job for the rest of your life. So, you know, build on where you want to go and have opportunities to develop in those spaces. And I think if we start looking at it much, much earlier with people that we're going to break down so many more barriers and create way more opportunities for people over the course of their lives. Um, and then uh, I guess, um, Jackie, picking up a, a little bit that you were talking about there of, of kind of recognising the value that actually comes from, from businesses. Are there other things that you think that um, when they're thinking about uh, inclusion, are there other things that you think that we can do to encourage uh, corporate investors to think about not just inclusion, but also um, uh, the technology that can go along with that? Uh, are there things that you think that we can be encouraging corporates to think about? In, do you mean in, in the the kind of corporations that are producing those uh, particular pieces of equipment? I, or guess, just in so. general? I guess that's 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 part of it. Um, but I yeah. think in in general as well, there's obviously value in us having having um, seeing the value that that diverse workforces have, mm -hmm. uh, and and in 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 recognising that we know that uh, the investment that that those corporates need to make into um, into technology to, to make allowances mm. for um, the diverse workforce that we do have. Mm. How can we encourage them to kind of think that that, that investment is worthwhile? I th some of it is just the realisation, I think, that um, people with disability on the whole, uh, by virtue of that disability, will, will be ingenious. They will be in innovative. Um, they will be practised at finding workarounds because we've had to do that um, pretty much all our lives. So they bring, we bring uh, a, a different kind of perspective, different kind of knowledge, um, and that can actually be used. It's partly, as we were talking about earlier, the, the need to include people with disability in the production of uh, accessibility, whether that's devices or, or practice or whatever. But it's not just about that. It's, it's simply, I, I think, about the additional perspective, the novel perspective uh, on working practices or anything else, customers, students, that someone with disability does bring. Brilliant. Then we've had people tuning in tonight from all over the world. We've had someone, mm. uh, a couple of people in India, Boston. Um, mm. We've had a question here as well from uh, someone in Perth. So Gail has asked, how can people with disability influence product developers so that products are not only functional, but also look modern and stylish? People don't feel like they're using or wearing or living with a piece of medical equipment that doesn't fit with their lifestyle, their style or their interior design. People follow that question. I think it's a brilliant question. So uh, how can we have products that 
aren't just functional, but how, how can we uh, make sure that they look good and, and that they're kind of their high quality uh, in, in their design as well? Um, Jackie, do you want to take that one to begin with? Well, obviously, if you're uh, somebody is buying something, then you're going to be aiming for the thing that suits you. And if you are demanding um, something that is stylish, um, pleasant, uh, doesn't look medical. I mean, when I was growing up and was wearing hearing aids, um, they were always what were called flesh toned. Flesh toned meant that kind of um, orthopedic beigey pink uh, colour, the same colour as, you know, cowpole or something like that. Um, of course, for many people who didn't have beigey pink skin tone, it wasn't skin tone at all. But also, I mean, it, 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 it looked like a large pink slug stuck behind your ear. It was the antithesis of stylish. Nowadays, um, you, you can see, you can get hearing aids in all sorts of snazzy, wonderful colours and a variety of colours and so on, um, which I think is, you know, is great. But it's been fresher from the people who, who use them. Uh, and their families and so on over time that's that's created that the the other way of thinking about that is um why should it why is this ever a question why should it not be the case that people with different kind of disability want whatever kind of device they might be using to be as as good looking and as as stylish as an item of clothing or an item of furniture or their haircut or whatever. And it comes back to that fundamental attitude that I think still lurks there in, in a lot of people and in a lot of institutions um, that people with disability are not quite the same as and don't have the same uh, desires, urges, needs, wishes as people who don't have disability. I think that particularly holds for people with intellectual disability um, as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, another whole topic. Janice, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add in on to Jackie's point. I think um, developers and um, innovators and in that, it's the understanding of the user experience. Who, who's gonna use it and what do they want? So I think if they're able to take that on board like any of us, you want you only want to use products that are cool, that uh, look fun, look sexy. You don't want to use big clunky things that other people don't use out in community. Um, so that that understanding the user and how they're going to use it and how they want it to live with their lives is really important. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point. I, I I have been around the disability industry long enough to remember when the first iPhone came out, and I remember. Um, talking to one of our young clients who um, he just thought it was the coolest thing when he was able to have his speech device actually on his on his iPhone and uh, yeah. and I think that you know we've we've come a long way since then but in some ways we haven't moved a lot since then as well. Now Pete, we are taking that of, further um, though at a more at a, like a slightly more fundamental level though like coming from sort of the the the, the heart of sort of you know tech tech you know tech land in Silicon Valley. I think we just also need more disabled people to be involved and to like train as software engineers, product developers. Like, you know, I've worked alongside a lot of great people in the Valley who, you know, they care, but they don't have that personal experience. And no matter how well intended you are, it is always obvious when products are built by those who have that personal experience. And again, and I don't know, sort of, I'm not really sure what the exact answers are at the moment, but like, there is just a massive shortage of, of people with disabilities going into, you know, professions like design, software engineering, like all of those sorts of things where they can then be central to the, to the, to the building and development of those products to be more accessible. Absolutely agree. So what do we need? Scholarships? What, how do we make that happen? Well, you could do, oh, sorry, Shireen, I was just going to say, it's really about representation, involvement and presence and it being valued role, it being a paid role. Um, and you can do that a multitude of ways. It could be targets, it could be quotas, um, or it's just, you know, you're getting funding for something. So make sure there's a role there for someone with a disability to play a really active role in the development of products. Yeah, so... That Pete, like definitely what Janice uh, sort of uh, mentioned, but I think also you know there there has to be sort of 
quite significant investment in, in sort of skilling and, and, and training as well. Um, you know, I, I've, it has been a massive challenge for me to, to, to find, you know, software engineers who, 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 can, who can join, I think, when we were hiring last year. And so, like, I, I do think there does need to be a pipeline or, um, you know, a better pipeline, investment, sorry, in that pipeline of, like, training people, scholarships, whatever, whatever it needs to make sure that the disability community, the pe people do, do, do have those requisite skills and education needed. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Well, there's a challenge for all of us. Um, so tonight, um, this has been a, a remarkable conversation and we're looking for remarkable insights. So I wonder just as, as we kind of draw to a close, uh, my last question to each of you is, what is your remarkable insight on how disability can inform innovation? Let's start with you, Shreen. Oh, difficult one. Um, so look, to me, the, the, the remarkable thing is that it's, there's a huge opportunity and potential on, on every measure, right? Whether it's optimizing for just well-being and, and impact of, 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 of everyday people, there is just so much opportunity to make big improvements here. And, you know, investment in this area goes such a long way. Um, and for me, that is it's the, the remarkable opportunity, but also I think the remarkable challenge to get the world to get the world to to to, to think like this. I think that is the challenge. Uh, what about you, Jackie? What's your remarkable insight? Well, as a third way, I think one would be that um, inclusion should be absolutely unremarkable. I'm afraid, um, but aside from that, I guess it's that. If we are open-minded enough about it and inclusive enough, then it, we may find that the non-standard way of doing things, the way that we've done everything before, um, the non-standard way uh, is better, is more efficient, is more effective. Uh, and it may be a disabled person who can um, show the way to that. And last but not least, Janice. Look, I, th I think mine just um, reiterates kind of what we've said throughout tonight is um, involve and do it with people with disabilities. Um, they need to be fundamental on this journey and driving this journey. They're the ones going to be using the products and the services and that we um, and are part of the world that we all live in. So they need to be um, at the forefront of driving it. Yeah, absolutely. Um... And we've had a couple of other comments come through um, just during this last one. Uh, Laura just saying uh, the value to the business is the impact of an individual with disabilities has on culture of the organisation and transforming the working environment. They teach tolerance, resilience, commitment to improvement. Uh, and then we also had uh, Gail uh, just posting that, um, that this certainly, some of the topics that we've raised tonight uh, came up in a poll. Um, and you can see the link, uh, the link there. Uh, and then Mahul uh, is asking uh, um, his son, Arian, who has CP, uses a wheelchair. And he believes that disability is an advantage. Um, Sreen, is that your experience? And if so, in what way? We might just sneak that question in before, uh, before we finish up. Um, I'm just sort of a slightly sort of philosophical level. I think it sort of you know, you have to make it an advantage, right? I don't think, I don't think it inherently has to be a disadvantage or a, or an advantage. Like, um, for it, you know, of course it carries, you know, objective things that are difficult, but I think at the end of the day, it is just working out, okay, what, what can I, what can I utilize out of this experience that confers some, you know, benefit to, to those around me? Like, and where can I use my experience of disability to be more empathetic to those with disabilities as well. So, you know, I don't think there is an inherent sort of, you know, you are disabled, you have these, you, you have these abilities, you've got to really want to work on them and really have like the intention or desire to actually use them for the benefit of others. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, um, I want all of the people who are with us on the webinar to uh, join me in thanking our panelists tonight, Srin Matapali, Jackie Leach, Scully, and Janice O'Connor. Also want to say thank you to Taryn, our interpreter as well. Thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us. So 
tonight remarkably thanks to you guys for organizing um, all of this it's our pleasure and we hope to have you on again uh, each of you on again um so really remarkable uh is about harnessing technology to build inclusion of people with disability and if you're solving a problem in the disability space we'd love to hear from you uh, no matter where you are in the world and we want to see if we can support you on your journey uh, you can head to our, our website uh, remarkable.org.au um, we'll also be seeking some feedback from you after tonight uh, this is our first of this uh, this type of panel so um, we'd love to get some feedback from you um, so please take some time to complete that survey uh, we'll also make uh, the recording of tonight available uh, afterwards as well and you can look at that on our YouTube channel um, this kind of conversation that we bring we believe is vital uh, um, we we do know that there is so much more work to be done uh, and uh, we believe that uh, conversations like these brave conversations that uh, that help us imagine a new future, but help to bring that new future into the now is really what is needed. So we hope you join with us. Uh, we'll have another one of these in a month's time. Um, we'll, we'll probably have that during the middle of the day next time. Um, but we, we do thank you for, for joining us tonight and thanks again to our panelists. Uh, so thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>